Hello, my name is Father Benedict Keeley, a priest of the Ordinariate of Our Lady of Walsingham. What a blessing it is to be here in Walsingham, England's Nazareth. And I greet you from the chapel at Dowry House in the heart of the village. The Gospel on this second Sunday of Lent reads as follows. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain where they could be alone by themselves. There in their presence, he was transfigured. His clothes became dazzlingly white, whiter than any earthly bleacher could make them. Elijah appeared to them with Moses and they were talking with Jesus. Then Peter spoke to Jesus. Rabbi, he said, it is wonderful for us to be here. So let us make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, they were so frightened. And a cloud came covering them in shadow, and there came a voice from the cloud. This is my son, the beloved, listen to him. Then suddenly when they looked round, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. As they came down from the mountain, he warned them to tell no one what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. They observed the warning faithfully, though among themselves they discussed what rising from the dead could mean. Many years ago, not long after I was ordained a priest, I went for a long weekend to visit an old school friend who was living with his wife and young child in Frankfurt, Germany. On the Sunday, I attended Mass, not come celebrating because I can't speak German. I could just get the sense that the Gospel of the day was the story of the Transfiguration, the very Gospel of this second Sunday in Lent. It may well have been Lent, I can't remember. What I do remember very distinctly is that during the homily, at one point the priest used two English words, listen and hear. I presumed that he was telling the people that in English there's a great difference between listening and hearing. Perhaps there's no such difference in German, I don't know. After Mass, I approached the priest and asked him if I had been correct in my assumption. Gratifyingly, he said I had been, and that was the very point he was making, that hearing and listening are very different. Our beloved late Pope Benedict XVI, that masterful teacher and wisest of scholars, once wrote that the authentic and central program of the Lenten season is to listen to the word of truth, to live, speak and do the truth, to reject lies that poison humanity and are the door to all evils. Hold on to that thought which we shall return to. We tend, in a rather superficial and trivial way, to think of Lent as a time of giving up things, chocolate, alcohol, or our morning coffee. Perhaps we might add some prayers, do that little bit more than our usual in our spiritual lives. Some devotions, the Stations of the Cross, an extra Mass, maybe some time of adoration. All these things are good and praiseworthy, but go back to Benedict and let his words permeate your hearts as we progress through this meditation. The central program of the Lenten season is to listen to the word of truth. Who is the word of truth? Jesus. And how do we listen? T.S. Eliot, the American poet who, the longer he lived in England, seemed to become more English than the English, a devout Anglican, albeit a sinner like each one of us, wrote in The Rock, where is the wisdom we have lost in knowledge? Where is the knowledge we have lost in information? What an extraordinary word of poetry written in the 1930s, but which describes perfectly the world in which we live in the 21st century. Eliot could not have imagined the world of so-called information not just computers, but computers we have in our pockets that we also call telephones. The internet, 24-hour television, the grotesqueries of TikTok, 
and the never-ending flow of fake news from a legion of sources, legion being the operative word. What has been the casualty, and almost a critical casualty, of this flow of information? Yes, not just as Eliot says, the loss of wisdom, the loss of knowledge, but the soul-destroying loss of truth. We are, we are told, in a post-truth world. There is my truth and your truth. The reality is, of course, if there is my truth and your truth, there is no truth. We Christians have none of that. Not only is there objective truth, he is a person. He proclaimed himself to be the truth. We can know him, love him, and serve him. And in knowing, loving, and serving him, find true freedom. In the collect for this Sunday, the opening prayer, with an obvious reference to the gospel, we pray that during this Lent our spiritual sight may be made pure. So now we have both listening and seeing, but quite different, and we might say more important than hearing and seeing physically, but not apprehending or comprehending. So let us approach the scriptures with those thoughts in mind percolating, praying that we may begin to see and listen to the word of truth. Both in the first reading from the book of Genesis and the second from the letter of St. Paul to the Romans, they both remind us of who Jesus is, the beloved son, anticipated in the person of Isaac and referred to by St. Paul as the beloved son, whom God did not spare for our salvation. And we come to the gospel. We touch our heads to let his word penetrate our minds, our heart that he may unblock and unfreeze those spiritual arteries that pump life around our bodies, and our lips that having listened and been converted, we may proclaim the word of life by our lives and our lips. Described in all three synoptic gospels, essentially with no difference, and referred to by St. Peter as an eyewitness in his second letter, Jesus takes his closest companions, Peter, James, and John, up the mountain of Tabor. The mountain, as we know in scripture, is where the presence of God is encountered. It is where Moses and Elijah, the law and the prophets, who are both seen with Jesus, each had their own separate experiences of God's presence. Not without reason, even to this day, do monks and hermits seek lonely caves and monasteries on mountains to hear the voice of God. Where do we ascend to hear him? A cloud descends, the Shekinah in Hebrew, the very presence of God, and something extraordinary happens. According to the great spiritual writer, Brother Simeon, also known as Erasmo Maricakis, who provides many insights which have helped me greatly in this meditation, we only hear the voice of God the Father twice in the entire New Testament, an extraordinary thought. And each time, those two times, he says the same thing, this is my beloved son. This divides us from our Jewish brethren, our older brothers in the faith, as St. John Paul used to say. It flatly contradicts Islam, which proclaims loudly that God has no son. Jesus is the beloved son of the Father. God from God, light from light, consubstantial with the Father. The Father commands the apostles present and all of us who listen to his word, proclaimed as authentically as on the mountain when the gospel is proclaimed, he commands us to listen to his beloved son, speaking only twice in the New Testament. We will only listen to God's voice through the mouth of Jesus. To have seen and heard him, as he told Philip, is to have seen and heard the Father. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father but through him. He is transfigured, shining with what St. Gregory Palamas called uncreated light, a doctrine for the Orthodox Church and greatly encouraged by John Paul II, who gave us the luminous mysteries of the Rosary, including the Transfiguration. The apostles see Moses and Elijah with Jesus, and they fall on their faces with wonder. And then it ends almost as quickly as it began. 
for no one, as Pope Benedict has said, is permitted to live on Tabor while on earth. They go down the mountain, being told by Jesus, they would only understand all they'd experienced after he had risen from the dead, a word they did not understand at the time. Benedict XVI said, this is the gift and commitment of each one of us in the Lenten season, to listen to him. But hearing, as my German priest said, is not the same as listening. We hear, to echo Eliot, much. We are drowned in sound, with information, but are no more knowledgeable, no wiser. We apprehend, but do not comprehend. That's why the Father commands us to listen to him. To listen, we might say, is to hear authentically, to know what we are hearing. Merikakis says the command is to imbibe him, literally to drink him in, to take his word to heart. Pope Benedict, again, our wise guide, tells us that Lent stimulates us to let the word of God penetrate our life. My love of etymology makes me look at two words of the late Pope, stimulate and penetrate. In its roots, to be stimulated is to be goaded from the old Norse meaning speared, then penetrated in its root to be placed within. If we listen to Jesus, his word will spear us, enter us, puncture us, and go deep and place within us his word. It will take root in our heads, our hearts, and on our lips. We will be converted to the truth, our Lenten program. We will now take a short pause. Please join us again in a few moments as we continue our Lenten reflection. Welcome back to our Lenten reflection. While we are on earth, said Pope Benedict, our relationship with God takes place more by listening than by seeing. But there are brief moments of seeing. Remember that purified spiritual sight for which we prayed in the collect. The apostles saw for a moment, a moment of what Guardini called radiant clarity, the summer lightning of the coming resurrection. For a few brief moments, the daily veil that covers the sublime, according to the Anglican poet Malcolm Geit, was revealed. Revelation is how things really are, a glimpse behind the veil. And where do we see things as they really are? Where is the veil removed for a moment and we can share the experience of Tabor to be in the presence of God on the mountain, in the Mass? That sounds so simple, doesn't it, and almost unbelievable. How can the, let's be honest, sometimes dull experience of the Mass be the moment of Tabor, where we do indeed see with the purified eyes of faith behind the veil to things as they really are? St. Peter says in his second letter, when he remembers being on the mountain, we were eyewitnesses of his majesty or glory. Merikakis says, Jesus is here the one who can bridge the abyss between the awesome holiness of God and our own blindness and corruption. At the Mass, where we are both at Calvary and the Last Supper, Christ is seen, and if we have the ears to hear, listen to. All the talk of new evangelization, the programs, PowerPoints, expensive diocesan pamphlets, training sessions, and endless meetings and synods are gongs booming and cymbals clashing. If the Mass is not the place where beauty, truth, and goodness are encountered. Remember the experience of the emissaries of Prince Vladimir of Russia, sent out into the whole world to discover the true religion in the 10th century. Arriving at the Hagia Sophia in Constantinople, the Cathedral of the Holy Wisdom, they walked in while Mass, the Divine Mysteries, were being celebrated. They wrote, We knew not 
whether we were in heaven or on earth, so beautiful that it seemed. They discovered the true religion, the experience of Tabor, in the liturgy. We will only evangelize our pagan world through the beauty of the Mass, the best of everything, music, preaching, vestments. It's not the poor who complain of the expense of the beauty of the liturgy. The poor built the greatest cathedrals in the world with their hard-earned pennies. It's those who have plenty of worldly goods but hard hearts. Eternal life, the Church teaches, begins now, as Guardini says, this eternal life does not wait until after death to begin. It already exists. The essence of Christian consciousness is founded on its presence through faith. This is why the Tabor experience, our listening and seeing with the eyes of faith to what is behind the veil, is so crucial for us to understand. So if, as we began this meditation, we return to the words of Pope Benedict on this Transfiguration Sunday, that the central program of Lent is to listen to the word of truth following the Father's command. Benedict concludes, because of that, we will know what he calls the fundamental truth, who we are, where we came from, where we must go, what path we must take in this life. This fourfold fundamental truth, the fruit, not only of listening to Christ during Lent, but throughout our lives, is both a word of immense challenge for us in this time, but also a word of life, of hope and of joy. Another reason why the Christian message is good news for a fallen world. In a world which says we are either glorified animals, pre-programmed chemical machines, or lonely souls with no hope and no future, by listening to him, we know who we are, children of God. We are already, said St. John, the children of God. Pause for a moment and let that sink in. That is the fundamental truth. Every human, rich or poor, young or old, sick or healthy, unborn or nearing death, is a child of God. That's the message that will save the world, a message which is the answer to the epidemic of loneliness and suicide, and the true reason why Christians are or should be pro-life. Where we came from, the eternal mind of the Father. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. We are not accidents, plasma, slightly more intelligent apes. We are created. And our parents, mother and father, shared in that wonderful work of creation. Where we must go? To heaven. Because there's only one other alternative which exists and is a possibility, which listening to Christ, of course, affirms. We must have minds fixed on eternity, remembering we are dust, and unto dust we shall return, but destined for glory, for resurrection. The purification of sight is about seeing what is not only real, but important and valuable. What doth it profit a man if he gains the whole world, but loses his soul? What path we must take in this life? The Christian path, following in the footsteps of the one who led the way, who is the way, discovering our vocation, our divine calling. We take the path of truth to avoid the poison of lies, the path of faith and hope, the path of beauty, truth, and goodness. Truth eludes us, said Solzhenitsyn, if we do not concentrate our attention totally on its pursuit. Totally pursuing the truth is totally following the Lord. Listening and seeing him with purified eyes and ears, we can live lives of peace, not a peace the world brings, but a peace beyond human understanding. In other versions of the Transfiguration, not recorded by St. Mark, we are told Jesus leans forward and lifts up the disciples who have fallen flat on their faces, an image of worship but also of fear. In the book of Revelation, St. John also falls on his face in worship and fear. And once more, Scripture tells us Jesus leans forward and lifts him up, saying, Do not be afraid. There is, as the poet Geit has written, 
a daily veil that covers the sublime. But listening to him and seeing with purified eyes, knowing him in the scriptures and worshipping him in the divine mysteries, being touched and lifted by him in the sacraments, we will, like Peter, James and John, even for a brief moment, see things as they really are. Thank you for joining us. Please join us again next week as we continue our EWTN Lenten Reflections. <laughs>